Thank you, Jace. And the, the backstory to that is Jace was instrumental in all of those things, too. I don't know if you know he works for the Archdiocese. as uh, He's got a big, fancy title. But part of it is campus ministry, right? Director of campus ministry. So if we're going to build beautiful, fruitful, good campus ministry, we need great partners at the Archdiocese. And who is greater than Jace in that? So thanks. Yeah. And what a fun event tonight. Thank you for organizing this. This is awesome. So this is the largest group of young adults I think I can say I have ever spoken to. So um, that's fun. Take it easy on me. I know the title of my talk sounded about like maybe the most boring title you could ever imagine, right? Moral Theology and Virtue Ethics. Um, it's it's going to be a little heady, but we're going to make it really, really fun because I don't like to be the only one to talk. So it's going to be very interactive. We're going to get to the, the root of what it means to be a good human person together. But we're going to start because it's Theology on Tap. Are we allowed to call it that? Yeah, that's the official name, right. So it's, it's Theology on Tap. So we're going to start with what uh, does it take to make a good beer? What is beerness? So shout out your answers when you know them. What, uh, what does it take to, to actually be a delicious, refreshing, and classified as a beer? Cold German. Hops. Cold German hops. Time. Yeast. Yeast. OK, so um, there's some uh, very cold gin and tonics being served right now. So the essence of beerness can't be just that it's cold. Right? There's some, uh, um, maybe some, uh, the yeast is in, in the fermenting of the, the wine as well. So anybody drinking wine out there, yeastiness is uh, in your wine. Um, Germanness, some of the best German liqueurs. Um, some like Benedictine, b and B. I don't know if you've had that before. Very German, very delicious. So we, we start you know, throwing adjectives out there of what it, what it might be. And, and we've got these what are called accidents. Right? But the essence, the substance of beer, beerness itself is what we're trying to get to. Any other accidents you want to throw out there? Any other things that, of beerness, trying to get to the root of, of what a beer is? No wrong answers. Wait, are we naming the essence or the essence? Well, you keep going either way. What do you got? Alcohol. Yep, it's got to have alcohol. Uh, oh, duels doesn't count, right? That's not beer. <laughs> Sorry for being an alcoholic, but. Uh huh. Right. So it's hard to put a one sentence definition to what a beer is, right? It's you know it when you taste it. Um, it's got all the right properties and qualities, but ultimately, beerness itself is made up of multiple different things. The official beer judging um, competition bases its beer, whether a beer is good or not, on five criteria, okay? It's the appearance, what is the, the color, the clarity, right? We've got a, I've got a, an uh, English ale, so it's a, a nice brown, nice um, claret color. Uh, the second is aroma, right? How hoppy, if it's an IPA, it's gonna be extra hoppy in your aroma. The flavor, the mouth feel, so you gotta swish it around a little bit. That's a nice mouth feel right there. <laughs> and then of course the alcohol content. Right, so we're judged, uh, a beer is judged on those five things to whether or not it's gonna truly be quality beer. It is what it is, right? It, it is what it claims to be. And if somebody puts um, sparkling cider in your glass and claims that it's beer, you're gonna spit it in their face because you know that's, that's not beer, right? I asked for a beer, you gave me something else, right? So what we're getting to tonight is a, an equally difficult question is what does it mean to be a good human person? Right? And we can throw around, and we're going to, all of those same adjectives. What does it mean to be a good human person? Um, if we distill it down, ultimately, like, you know, people will be like, but I'm a good person. Right? What, is, what does that mean? Right? Is, is being a good person enough? And, and where does that fit in our seeking to be saints? Right? Because ultimately, we want to be with God in heaven forever. So. The, the same qualities of color, aroma, mouth feel, we can distill down into what it means to be a good human person, and those qualities we call virtues, right? And virtues, uh, in, a, in a large sense, have gone the way of the dinosaurs in our 
cultural perception of what it means to be a good person. Nobody talks very much about virtues and vices in our popular culture. Um, if you had to come up with the virtues of the popular culture, what do you think the most important virtues of today, people, your, your peers out there who may be not as enlightened as you, what do you think they would say? Yeah. Acceptance. Acceptance, Acceptance or tolerance. What else? Performance. Performance. Wealth. Happiness. Happiness. Happiness is an important one. Status. And, of course, the all-encompassing niceness. Right? Everyone should be nice. Niceness is the only virtue that's left in our culture today. If you are a mean person, then you are a bad person. But if you are nice, then everything else is forgiven, right? Niceness is the, the only virtue left. But um, niceness uh, doesn't cut it in actually being a good, truly good person. When we talk about what is the good, niceness could be an important, uh, the virtue most closely assigned to niceness is affability. Um, but if you're too nice, um, if you're nice all the time, that vice is obsequiousness or um, being a suck up. Have you ever been around those kind of people? You can never trust what they're saying. They're nice all the time. Obsequiousness is actually a vice. So this culture of nice, Jesus wasn't nice sometimes, right? He flipped over tables. He called people out when they needed to be called out. It wasn't always just nice. So we're getting more to the root, hopefully, of what it means to be virtuous. So the point of this talk is um, not to teach you every virtue that Aristotle and St. Thomas Aquinas came up with. It's not to uh, help you to avoid every vice in your life, but it is to help you come up with a framework in your own life to live more authentically. All too often, we sort of float through life, and our culture really helps that because there's so much entertainment, there's so much going on that, um, to distract us from, from actually thinking and pondering that virtue never enters into our head and we're just kind of response to stimuli. And so I propose this talk as a, a framework to help you actually become saints, right? Who here wants to go to heaven? Okay, great, you're at a, you're at a theology on tap talk, you're in the right place, right? You wanna go to heaven, right? And um, who here knows how to get there? I think you should raise your hand, you know the answer, right? Okay, good, right? Jesus, right, is the way, the truth, and the life. But there's a lot of those intermediate things that actually I think you know. I think our generation is one of the most well-educated in the faith. Like you think about the Middle Ages, they probably didn't have as much knowledge or truth at their fingertips as we do. Like they didn't know what transubstantiation means, and I would guess that most of you in here probably know what transubstantiation means, right? The, the Eucharist becoming the, the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus. But where we fail, and they were pretty good, is it this practice of virtue, obtaining virtue. Now virtue in and of itself, the definition of a virtue, is a habit that disposes you to the good. How many think to yourself, is like, oh yeah, I have a lot of those habits that dispose me to the good. Normally when we talk about habits, we talk about bad habits, right? Like smoking and drinking. Not always bad, good in moderation, right? But habits that dispose you to the good are actually called virtue. So the, the goal of this is to try and give all of us a framework to desire to grow in real, meaningful, tangible ways, to desire to become a saint, to be a little more reflective in our own lives, and not just let life happen to us. Oh, but Father, you know, aren't we just supposed to, to let the will of God, you know, your will be done, wash over me? Sure, yes, be merry, fiat. But we're also called to be cooperators in our own salvation, right? Jesus um, will not save you without you. He will not save you without your cooperation. He's not going to save you against your will. And growth in virtue, striving to be a saint, striving to be holy, is the, the primary means by which your salvation is worked out in this world, in the concrete world. See, our world needs saints today. Saints are always witnesses, always examples to the whole world of what God can do in somebody's life, how he can transform, and, and that the power of the gospel is true. It's real. It's not fake. And so we need witnesses. We need saints in our own time, which means we need to be willing to do the hard work of growing in virtue. So a habit that disposes us to be a good, we have to know what it means to, to be good, to be a, a good human being, right? King David, when his death drew near, he gave these instructions to his son Solomon. I am going the way of all flesh. Take courage and be a man. 
Keep the mandate of the Lord your God, following his ways and observing his statutes, commands, and ordinances, and decrees as they are written in the law of Moses, that you may succeed in whatever you do. So what does that mean, to, to be a good human, to be good? So let's break that question down. What do you think it means to be a good human? What would be a, a defining characteristic of, of being good? Shout them out. Kindness. Kindness. Compassion. Compassion. Selflessness. Virtues. Selflessness. Virtue. Yes, we're trying to get to those virtues. Strength. Um, love of the Lord. Love of the Lord. Charity. Charity. Humility. Patience. Patience. Faith and hope. Man, you guys are naming virtues. This is easy. This is great. <laughs> Anything else? Prudence. Prudence. Justice. Prudence, justice, temperance, fortitude. fortitude. <laughs> hey, look at that. Uh, faith, hope, love. Good. You guys are anticipating. What do you think? So if, you, if we reframe the question of, from what it means to be just a good person to what it means to be a good Christian, how do you think it changes? Forgiveness, mercy, it's not a natural virtue. Love your neighbor more than you love yourself. Selflessness to the point of, of self-sacrifice, yep, definitely a particularly Christian thing. Sacrifice in general. Sacrifice, the meaning of sacrifice, yeah. Uh -huh. Follow the way of the light, not the way of the world. Uh-huh. Yeah, so again, the answer in Sunday school to every question? Jesus. Jesus, that's right, you guys are so right. So Jesus came not only um, to, to save us, the catechism says. Yes, that's first and foremost, he's on, on a mission of mercy, a rescue mission to deliver us from evil. But Jesus also came, the catechism says, to reveal man to himself. Right? So Jesus is the form of every human virtue. And his example of living that virtue, his um, witness, is what takes an Aristotelian project right because aristotle is the one who actually came up with the virtues and, and how to be good how to be a good human it takes what's merely a, a philosophical project and transforms it by sanctifying grace into truly how to become a saint and so with every virtue there, there's a couple of divine helps one there's the the example of jesus christ right so Knowing Jesus is, is that the foundation of what it means to be a human person. Knowing him well, the real Jesus, having a relationship with him, loving him. If we strive to, to be good, we want to follow goodness himself, which is Jesus. The second is, St. Thomas taught that every moral virtue is not only a, a merely natural thing, but it's an infused with supernatural grace. And that supernatural grace is given to us because we are weak, right? So you know the whole problem with the fall? Right, the whole apple thing. There was a fig, you know, who knows exactly the fruit, but it's a, it's a bad deal. Um, and one of, the, one of the problems with the fall is not only we were disobedient to God, yes, but the effects, the consequences. So one of the consequences of the fall is that virtue is hard. We didn't need to seek to grow in virtue before the fall. It came naturally. Um, before the fall, we had a, an order. The intellect ruled the will, and the will ruled the passions. And ever since the fall, we've been trying to get back to that correct order, where the intellect rules the will and the will rules the passions. But all too often, what's in control? The passions, right? The passions drive our life. We're hungry, so we're going to cut off the person in traffic on the way to Whataburger so that we can get in the drive through line a little bit faster than them, because that um, bacon cheeseburger is going to take so, taste so much better with the loser behind me um, still behind me, right? <laughs> The passions, the passions take over, and, and the order of things all of a sudden get disrupted, right? Or um, any other number of examples. I'm sure you can come up with many in your own life, right? This, this disorder is natural to us. Well, what virtue does is it strengthens the will. See, I said I think you guys are pretty smart. I think the intellect is out there. If you really are confused on a moral issue, which there are still confusing moral issues, and, and that's good, um, but you can uh, Google Catholic Answers, type in your search, and you can get the right answer. A lot of times people will come to me in confession and say, oh, Father, I just, I really don't know the right answer, I really don't know the right thing. And I'll have to just challenge them and be like, oh, yeah, you do. <laughs> I mean, you know it up here. The hard part is, is living it in here. And where the virtue comes is, is in that strengthening of the will, making that habit, choosing that good over and over and over again. That is virtue. And St. Thomas teaches that if you grow in one virtue, you strengthen all the virtues. 
right? And so at any time you're, you're seeking to be good, you're seeking to do the good, you're seeking to form that habit of good, then you're strengthening your will to choose that good over and over again. And those passions which want to rule your life, those passions which tell you to cut off the guy on the way to Whataburger, they all of a sudden have to take a back seat to this disposition to choose the good. I've chosen the good over and over again, and I know it's the right thing to do, and I have the habit of doing it, so I'm gonna do it again. So even when we're, um, so normally we sin uh, in, in times of weakness, right? We're hungry, we're angry, we're lonely, or we're tired. That's the time when, when sin is the, the most prevalent, and that acronym, hungry, angry, lonely, tired, HALT, is a good like, acronym to be like, wait, stop, think a minute, do I really want to do this, or am I just hungry? Do I just need a Snickers, right? Am I angry? Do I just need to deal with whatever situation is happening right now? Am I lonely? Am I really seeking to be loved? And is this the best way to fulfill that love that I'm seeking? Or am I just tired? Maybe a nap. <laughs> I'm going to come at this later, and it's not going to seem like such a huge deal. So the virtue is so that when we're in those vulnerable states, we've chosen the good so many times, it doesn't have to be a fight, right? Because in those moments, there's this fight of the will over those passions, and it's not always that the will wins. But when we've chosen the virtue over and over again, and, and it comes second nature to us, right? It comes easy to us. Then even in those times of difficulty, in those times of struggle, we're like, well, of course I'm gonna do the right thing, I do the right thing every time. And you might think, well, that, that shouldn't count. No, that's, that's how God made us. To, to choose the good so often that it comes naturally to us. The saints didn't have to stop and think like, Man, should I really punch this person in the face or not? No, they had a disposition to be charitable, to be patient, etc. So if we're really serious about rooting out sin in our life, if we're really serious about growing to become saints, then this topic of virtue all of a sudden becomes really important. Because like I said, I think we know the right things so often. Right? Every once in a while we're confused on a moral question. Every once in a while we wonder. Um, but it's the weakness of our will, it's that disposition to choose the good that we really need to work on. And our lives um, have become so soft. Oh my gosh, my life is so soft, guys. Like these hands, so soft, they haven't seen a hard day's work in, I don't know, months. <coughs> to choose the hard thing, all of a sudden, in our world, is really hard. And so, in little ways, that those acts of self-denial, those acts of, of trying to grow in virtue, will actually strengthen us to become the saints that God has made us to be. So, to that end, right, when we are in our lives, when there is a particular sin that we're struggling with, whatever it is, uh, a particular moral question or moral issue that we're wrestling with, right, if we, the priest might tell you, hey, you should, you should pray about that some more. And you should, right? Like, take that to prayer. Ask God for help. That is, uh, more, that is the more important part, right? That you seek the divine assistance. Because as we said, virtue is both um, of our own doing, but infused by God. That's a, a necessary part of it. But unless we're really willing to actually seek to change, to actually want to grow, we will keep spinning in the Adoration Chapel, wondering why God hasn't miraculously fixed us yet. I know I have had that... Um, experience before of, of just asking Lord you know why won't you take this sin away why isn't this happening well unless we're willing to give something a name to identify it to claim it um, to, to understand it we can the, the evil one can continue tricking us into falling into it and so the the name that we give sins that we habitually fall into are called vices right and the vices are plentiful there are many but whatever, if we, the evil one can keep us in the realm of just like, oh, it's just sin, like I keep doing it, I don't know, I don't know how to grow, and not, we don't have a, a coordinated effort to try and fight against it, then yeah, we're going to be back in the confessional next week with the same sins, struggling with the same vices, because we're not seeking actively to receive God's grace and grow in virtue. And so understanding more uh, about the virtues, learning about which vices we struggle with and the virtues that are contrary to them is necessary for our sanctification. Let's dive a little deeper into those virtues. We're going to just kind of do a cursory um, 
we could spend, I mean, I took moral theology for two whole semesters, so we could spend hours and hours talking about each individual virtue, each opposing vice, the virtues annexed to which virtues, they're like families and clusters of virtue, and I would really recommend you like do a deep dive into moral theology, because it's all, I think, really interesting. You might think it's really boring, but um, what it means to be good, what it means to be a good human person actually gets pretty intense. But let's do a, a, a very shallow dive into those cardinal virtues, right? So the cardinal virtues, um, Prudence, justice, fortitude, temperance. Prudence is the, the first. The definition of prudence is recta ratio agibilium. Anybody got a definition of that? Recta? That's right. Right reason acting. Hands for her. Clap, clap at her. Woo! Nice. I knew there would be people smarter than me here. I don't know. Recta ratio agibilium. So right reason in action or right reason acting. Prudence, says St. Thomas, is the only virtue that we can't teach ourselves. So if you are not prudent, <laughs> you can blame your parents, you can blame your, your priest, you can blame those mentors in your life who are supposed to teach you prudence. But if you're not great at prudence, don't worry, there's still hope. Find someone who can give good counsel. The gift of the Holy Spirit that teaches us prudence is the gift of counsel. Right? We talk about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And so learning prudence, right reason in action, has to be a trial and error process. And maybe you've experienced this in your life. Man, I tried this the first time, and it was a major fail. Maybe I should have asked a friend if this was the right thing to do at the right time. Um, but I'm going to try it next time, and I'm definitely not going to do it the same way. Right? That prudence um, is made up of many different parts. There are many parts of prudence, but it's what is the main virtue that tells us to know what to do when we need to do it. The virtue that perfects our practical reason. So reason is one of the greatest gifts that God has given us, right? To, to know, to understand, to see the truth of things. And prudence perfects that so that we can trust that we have the correct truth and we can respond correctly to that truth so that we know how to act rightly in every situation. But we need humility, right, as well to know that there are some situations where we might not know the right thing. But that ultimately that counsel, that wisdom of others are uh, super important to help us grow in prudence, right? So prudence um, comes with a lot of, of parts and where we fail most often in prudence and, and fall into the vice of imprudence is when we don't have one of the parts of prudence, circumspection, when we don't look around to spec, to look around and, and look all the way around the situation. We don't take enough time to actually try and understand and, we're foolhardy and rush into things. So prudence um, is a, a very important cardinal virtue. And, and again, it's one come up, came, that Aristotle came up with. He knew that humans needed to be prudent. They needed to be able to understand the truth of things and know how to respond to the truth of things in a prudent way. And as a young person, right, when, when do we struggle most with imprudence? You don't see a lot of 60-year-olds jumping off buildings and stuff, right? It's when we're young. Right? We're still forming that virtue. We're still forming that habit of knowing what the right thing to do is in the right situation. The second one is a commutative virtue. It's the virtue of justice. Right? And justice is to render each one their due. Is justice here? No, sometimes he's here. Um, to render each their due. So there is justice in every relationship that you have. And sometimes, justice is what ruins our relationships, right? Because in the modern world, we start to have a, a what do you do for me, what do I do for you, tit for tat, render each one what they're due sort of mentality. But to render each one what they're due takes on a whole new Christian context when we bring Christ into it, right? The, the witness of Christ transforms justice and actually places mercy under the heading of this cardinal virtue, right? So just, mercy is a part of justice, not just clemency like the ancients taught, but actual mercy which Christ has shown. So as a Christian, to render each one their due um, takes on a, a new and a profound meaning. And in justice, like when I offend you as a friend, right, when I offend you, I owe you a debt. And that debt for the reconciliation to be restored needs to be repaid, right? Injustice, I owe you. And we have this um, sometimes too in our day today, uh, a sort of a victim mentality, which can creep into our culture and even into our own lives and hearts, 
where we take this justice to be really serious, right? Like because of the trauma that I've suffered, because of the, the, the wrong um, that has been perpetrated against me, I am owed so much. Somebody owes me. Like this life owes me because I have suffered. And in one sense, in the purely natural sense, that's true. But if we don't ever come to justice's corollary, mercy and forgiveness, and even though someone isn't due forgiveness, be able to offer it to them, we'll never find the true peace and freedom that Christ desires for us. And so in justice, we want to live justly, holy, devoutly in this age, rendering to each one what they're due, taking account, taking pains to make sure that our accounts are settled and that we treat each according to their dignity. It's very important. But justice also has to be um, under, underlined and, and fulfilled in mercy um, and in, in forgiveness or uh, the whole world will be just owed one another and that repayment, which can only come through Christ and his mercy and love, will never be able to be found. Okay, prudence, you guys are prudes, good. Justice, you guys are just, great. Um, fortitude is the next one. Strength and endurance in the face of hardship is the definition of fortitude. And this is the one I, I kind of talked about earlier, this virtue in general, right? That we have to have the will to grow, that we have to be able to, to suffer the hard thing. Fortitude, in one of our, in one sense, I think is one of the, the virtues that is missing a lot in our culture. People talk about a lack of masculinity in our culture. Fortitude and masculinity, everyone is called to be fortitude, but fortitude and masculinity certainly have some connections. And um, strength of fortitude, strength to suffer well, strength to overcome the hard difficulties is missing. What does it mean to be a good person? It means to be able to suffer well. Even the pagan ancients knew that. Now, they didn't know the full meaning of suffering. They could be redemptive. But to be a good human person means there will be misfortune. And how we respond to that misfortune, how we respond to those struggles, whether we're able to triumph and overcome, that is one of the, the four essential cardinal characteristics of what it means to be human. I think that's kind of mind-blowing that even ancients recognized that how we suffer was essential to what it meant to be human. And so that fortitude, that strength, and that endurance in the face of hardship is going to be, again, one of the things that keeps us, it's either going to make us a great saint or keep us from realizing our full potential because we're all about our prayer programs in the beginning, right? The first week of a new resolution to pray hard perfect, right? Week two, meh, you know, we're kind of doing it. Week three, perseverance is one of the virtues under fortitude, that we are going to continue in the struggle. And if we strengthen our will and strengthen that virtue of fortitude, then those difficulties, right, seeking to overcome sin, seeking to, to fight against temptation, seeking to follow through on our promises, that fortitude, that strength, um, is what's going to carry us through to actually becoming who God is calling us to be. But again, this has to be a, a supernatural virtue, supernaturally infused virtue, because on our own we know how weak we are. And we know that the scriptures say the just man sins seven times a day. right? And that's the just man, so I can't imagine most of us. Um, but that fortitude to keep trying to get up, to receive God's grace and cooperate with God's grace, that is the, the, the grace and strength we need to actually be good human people. And then the last one is important that we talk about tonight. It's temperance, right? So temperance is the, the moderation of the pleasures of the flesh. Did you guys know that God made sex? Yeah. He invented it. So like he's cornering the market on it, actually. And he invented it really good. It's pretty incredible and all of the other sensual pleasures. One of the things I love about being Catholic is we are not Puritans, right? <laughs> Woo, exactly. Uh, it's so fun. The other day I was at Byron's Liquor. Anybody been there before? Over here, yeah, right? If you haven't been, they have the best. If you can't find um, bourbons, sometimes they'll hold them for you. If you've got some fancy bourbons that you want, Byron's will hold them for you. I was there, it was last year, I was buying liquor for the Bronco Bash, which was in October. And um, my cart was just full of alcohol. Like, uh, you know, to, for hundreds, 120 people, a cart full of alcohol, wearing the collar, and this lady, cute little old lady, pushing her cart, just stops dead in her tracks and looks at me. And she's like, you're not a real priest. I'm like, yeah, no, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a real priest. And she's like, no, you, that's a Halloween costume. You're not a real priest. 
I was like, no, I'm really, but, 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 but this, isn't, this isn't all for me. <laughs> it's, it's, we're having an event. And she's like, you're having a church event? And you're going to serve all of that liquor? The devil's juice? <laughs> Yeah, there, there are going to be a lot of people there. We're going to have a good time. Like, we're going to raise some money. We're going to drink a little bit. You know, we're gonna... So we are not Puritans. The pleasures of this life, you know, right? Uh, good food, good drink, um, the, the mutual love, the, the embrace of marriage are all wonderful, beautiful things designed by God to lead us and remind us of him, to teach us something of him. So the evil one can't create anything. Right? He can't make something out of nothing like God can. Only God can do that. And so what the evil one tries to do is to pervert or disorder or make an excess of something good that God has made or created. And so most of the time when we get in trouble in the realm of temperance, um, it's because we're actually desiring the, the good, but in a disordered way. We're desiring to be loved. We're desiring... Um, even just a pleasure, a pleasure for its own sake, in a disordered way that isn't according to either our state in life or right reason or um, God's will or plan for us particularly. And so where the virtue of temperance comes in is temperance is that moderation of those pleasures of the flesh, right? So you've heard all good things in moderation. That's the virtue of temperance. We have to temper those desires because we know where those desires come from, right? Our lower passions, the ones we share with the animals, and our, our lower passions all of a sudden start to rule our will, start to rule our intellect, block out what we, we know is the right thing to do and make our will weak enough where we're dumb enough to choose it. Temperance is that choosing over and over again moderation, enjoying life to the full as it should be, but not making uh, a misuse of those good things that God has given us that actually turn what is a, a gift into something that, that hurts us, into something that, that tears away who we are as a human person. And so all the virtues in the, the realm of temperance, and there are plenty, chastity, sobriety, et cetera, um, are for, again, recognizing who we are, recognizing the good that God is, and making those two things go together, right? Finding them, using them to draw us toward him. Um, St. Ignatius has the principle and foundation of all things, that if it leads us closer to God, if it leads us deeper in faith, hope, and love, it's good, accept it, delight in it. If it leads us away from God, um, if it leads us to desolation and, and to turn our backs to the Lord, kick it out of your life. It's not worth it, right? The principle and foundation is using, moderating those good things, using them in such a way that they lead you closer to the Lord and, and can be a, a fruitful part of your growth in holiness and virtue, right? So those are the cardinal virtues. They, they regulate the moral life. Then the theological virtues quickly are faith, hope, and charity. What do you think faith is? Hey, okay, Jesus, yes, yes. So faith, the definition of faith comes from St. Paul to the Galatians, I think. That's not in my head. Um, faith is the surety of things hoped for, the belief in things unseen. So it's assent to truths that are unseen. We don't see them, but they are to be believed, right? So you have faith in God. Have you seen God? Well, if you've been to Mass, if you've gone to adoration, yes, is the, the, the secundum quid answer of that, yes. But have you seen the, the old man with the white beard in the sky who you believe in? Sorry, that's not the God we believe in, but <laughs> just teasing you. But no, it's, it's a, a belief, truly, that the, there is a God of love, that he is all good, that he desires our good. All of these are, are taken on faith because while there are proofs in our life, there are proofs in the world, there are proofs that God exists. Ultimately, they must be believed by faith because they are things unseen, unthings seen that have to be believed. And, and um, one day, faith will go away. You guys will be faithless. When? When you see God face to face, you'll, you'll be able to see. You won't need faith. Hope. What's hope? Yep, yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Hope is the desire for an unattained good. Exactly. The desire for an unattained good. So maybe you hope that your crush is going to really make her move tonight, finally, or his move tonight. This is going to be the night, right? There's that unrealized good that you're super desirous of, and you're holding on hope. Right? It's a good, so for hope to be real, it has to be plausible, right? So don't be trying to punch out of your league. It's got to be plausible. 
And it has to be an actual good. It has to be a good thing. It's a false hope if you're hoping for something that's not actually good for you. And it's a false hope if it uh, is a, an unattainable good, right? So sometimes we hope to fly. Well, in one sense, that is attainable because one of the, the gifts of the, um, the uh, body of Jesus, what do we call that? Resurrected, Resurrected body, the glorified body is we'll be able to, to do something like fly, to apparate, whatever, like Jesus did. But right now, it's, a, it's not something you should hope for. You shouldn't climb up to the top of the roof and hope when you jump off you're going to fly. That would be a dumb hope, an unfounded hope. But it's the desire for an unattained good. Now, this hope, when we bring it into the theological sense, can be in, in two ways. You can, hope, you can only hope for what you can accomplish by your own power or with the help of your friends, right? And so maybe you can't hope to lift... Um, I don't know, 500 pounds, but if you have a buddy and he's been doing his squats and you've been doing your squats and you, you line up on either side, right, then boom, you got it, your hope is realized. What's incredible about Christian hope is your friend, who you can rely on to hope in, is Jesus, right? And I don't know if you know this about Jesus, but he can do anything, <laughs> right? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And so it just blows wide open the virtue of hope. What would have been totally impossible for us? Holiness, overcoming sin, vice and virtue, all of this all of a sudden becomes possible because you're not in this by yourself. Jesus is working with you, and so you can truly be hopeful. And in those days when you're giving into the sin of despair, when you're giving into the, the vice of doubt, um, know who is on your team. Like, Check out the penance. You've got the saints. You've got Mary. You've got Jesus. They're all fighting with you and for you. What reason have you not to be hopeful? The greatest sinner need not despair because with Christ, with the, the, the merits and treasury of the saints, there is so much to hope for. Okay? Great. Hope and ultimately charity. Charity, the definition of is? Desiring the good of the other. That's very clear. She said desiring the good of the other, which is technically the definition of benevolence. We're splitting hairs here, but yes. Right, okay, that is a, an alternate definition of charity, to help those in need, which takes its meaning from the original definition of charity. So, uh-huh. Willing, Willing the good of the other, again, is, I would say, benevolence. This is kind of a trick question, because Thomas gives both of those, St. Thomas gives both of those as right answers to the definition of charity, but later he defines charity as friendship with God, right? The ultimate definition of charity is friendship with God. So which of the theological virtues will remain? Faith will go away. Hope will go away, what have you to hope for in heaven? But charity, that friendship with God, will remain forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever, right? So the virtue of charity is what infuses all of the other virtues and makes them worth doing, right? If you don't have love, if you don't have that friendship with God that grounds all of your actions, that grounds you trying to grow in this or that thing, you're wasting your time, right? You're a clanging gong or a resounding cymbal. So charity has to underlie all of your seeking to grow all of your actions. That friendship with God has to be the root um, and, and the, the, the energy from which all these others flow. And then you can trust that God who will not be outdone in generosity and who loved you first will provide by his grace um, the effect of that love and, and mutual love and, and growth, which we call grace, right? And so that charity, that friendship with God is the ultimate virtue, the queen of all the virtues, says St. Thomas. Humility is the soil of all the virtues. Gratitude is the beginning of every virtue. So let's talk about gratitude for a second. I skimmed over a little bit, but um, it's part of justice. We owe to God our gratitude for all the good things that he's done to us. Gratitude, um, if you're not grateful for the good things that God has done already in your life, there's no reason to hope for anything else. So gratitude is the beginning of every virtue because you start to, to circumspect through prudence. You start to look around and realize God does stuff. Like the saints are real. Their lives happened. And so gratitude motivates you. Uh, it's the first of the, the virtues. Motivates you to grow in any other virtue because you're like, yeah, God is doing stuff in my life. I believe he can do more. Right? So if you're really struggling on a hard day to want to grow in virtue, focus on gratitude for a little bit. Okay, we covered the, the cardinal and the theological virtues. Again, we could break down these a lot more, but we're not going to because I think I've already talked way longer than most people talk at Theology on Tap. Um, but the, the ultimate uh, end of all of this, right, is heaven, to be a saint, to be um, like Christ, to put on Christ. Now, becoming like Christ is actually becoming more truly who you are, 
because Jesus doesn't want you to be a, a not yourself. He's created you special. He's given you particular gifts and charisms. Um, but just as uh, we can be ourselves, but be like the scrawny, untoned, or overweight, or whatever versions of ourselves, again, those are not necessarily bad things, but they're um, potential, right? We have the potential to grow. It means that there is something we can do more. So too, we can be the scrawny, or, or, or not, um, very engaged or whatever versions of our, our virtuous selves and the first step is to be more aware and to go to the gym right if we want to if we want to work on a particular muscle group we have to train it and go to the gym if we want to grow in a particular virtue we have to isolate that muscle we have to, to pull on the, the patients um, I don't know you can tell I'm not a gym bro because I don't even know what, what that one's called the, the tricep dip or whatever um, Push yeah, tricep push down, isolate that patient. So put yourself in an opportunity where you know you're going to need to be patient, right? And then just pull it down over and over again. And all of a sudden you're getting more patient, right? Right? Find your most annoying friend. They will sanctify you, <laughs> right? And, and pull that patience down until all of a sudden that muscle is stronger. You can choose to be patient more. Um, and then, so there, there are two ways ultimately that we learn about virtue. You can study St. Thomas. I would highly recommend it. He's really smart, guys. Um, and you don't think you can read it? You can. You can. You're, yeah, you, you guys are bright guys. Study St. Thomas. That's one way. But the other really important way that, to do it is to read the lives of the saints, right? The saints are unique and have particular <laughs> virtues that God gave them and helped them to grow in for a particular purpose. You too are unique. God wants to grow particular virtues. Um, within you to help you to help so that you might help him draw people deeper in their salvation draw people to him and so read the lives of the saints learn about the virtues that they had and then like Saint Ignatius he started with pride but actually it was a happy fault because he was like Saint Dominic Saint uh, Francis I can do that stuff I can do that better than them and so Saint Ignatius started to try and imitate those saints and all of a sudden grew in virtue and all of a sudden, you know, got a humility check, but became, became a great saint. So reading the lives of the saints, looking for virtue and examples of virtue and how they grew in their lives, step one. The second is to have good friends. That's why you guys are here tonight. This is a, a great community. And if you're going to grow in virtue, I am probably the most virtuous, I don't know, maybe, you know that, that when you wake up and you're between snoozes of the alarm clock, and it's just like everything's so perfect and peaceful. It happens again maybe just for a minute before you fall asleep, but like, I don't know, the world just seems right and everything's good. That's in my head where I'm the most virtuous, right? Because there aren't other people there, right? <laughs> but if virtue really is that habit, that strength, then if we're gonna be virtuous, we need other people in our lives to rub against and, and Mother Teresa had this, this image. She would shake a jar of pennies, or not a jar, like a sack of pennies, and walk around the novices and say, you will all be shiny pennies. Sorry for the Indian accent, it's not great. Or the Albanian accent. You will all be shiny pennies. And, and uh, the sisters are like, okay, she's lost it again. You know, mother's <laughs> maybe not temperate. I don't know what she's been doing back there, but. No, she's like, you will all rub against one another and what was dull and what was um, not beautiful by rubbing against one another in this, in this not novitiate will actually be beautiful and shiny and, and um, help you grow. So uh, if there is someone who is clearly leading you to sin, right? Every time you go around them, no matter how much virtue you muster up, no matter how much strength of will you muster up, they draw you into sin. That's maybe not your virtuous friendship, but you need those people just right on the edge, you know, where you, can, where you can practice patience, where you can practice not falling into gossip, where you can practice not falling into lust, right? Avoid those people who you know are always going to lead you, always and everywhere going to lead you into sin. Danger, Will Robinson, get out of there. Um, but find those people who are sinners themselves, but striving to grow in holiness with you. And through mutual forgiveness, through mutual encouragement, through, through the grace of friendship, you will grow in virtue. Okay, Father, that's great, but you just gave us kind of a brief overview, and I wish I could learn more. I'm so glad you asked. <laughs> Venerable Fulton Sheen, you guys like that guy, right? Hopefully be beatified soon. Victory over vice, okay? If you want a, a continued text, victory over vice. 
Peter Kreeft, super great philosopher, um, I think a pretty holy guy of his own right, back to virtue. Um, it looks like this, back to virtue, reclaiming uh, a moral theology of, of virtue, right? Learning the virtues that lead you to God, Romano Guardini. And then if you guys are going to be parents someday, your job, as I said, you, you've got to teach your kids prudence and, and many of these virtues. If you're going to be parents someday, um, one of the, the interesting ones for parents is boys to men, not the band, the transforming power of virtue. That's by Tim Gray and Curtis Martin. And then there are a lot of really good videos on the internet. So figure out what your vice is, Google it, not just what it is, but maybe like put vice after it because then you're going to go down a, you know, the wrong path. But find out what your vice is, Google it, find a Father Mike Schmidt's video or a, a Bishop Barron video, and take seriously this, this um, task that we have in front of us, this desire to truly grow, right? Let's not just be passive Catholics waiting on the grace of God to do everything. Let's jump in there. Let's admire the saints and seek to be like them. Let's hold one another up, and let's really try and grow in virtue. Okay, we didn't pray at the beginning. We should have done that. We'll pray after the questions, um, and maybe we're not time for questions. I don't know. We got plenty of time for questions. So let's talk. I got, you got Q's, I got A's. Yes, John. So when you go boil things down to their very core, he asked, does it come down to a choice of self-indulgence or self-abstinence? So that's a really good question, and it's, uh, it's really prevalent to, to do that duality in our own moral lives. And it's because we get it from our culture. The person who brought forward that theory, that there is good or there is evil, and if it feels good, it's bad and self-indulgent, um, that's why we have like decadent chocolate cake on menus and sinful, um, sinful vanilla mudge slide, whatever, whatevers. Is that really sinful? No. But where we got that idea is from Kant. And so it's, it's very Kantian to think in this dualism of if it's pleasurable to me, if I like it, it must be bad. But if I can deny myself, if it's hard for me, then it must be good. That's not Aristotelian, that's not Catholic, that's not um, St. Thomas Aquinas virtue ethics, right? Like we talked about, it needs to be tempered, temperance needs to be there. So there will be times of self-denial. There are fast days. Every Friday is technically a fast day, you guys know that, right? And then there are times of feasting where we should not be self-indulgence, but indulge in the good things of life for the glory of God, to rejoice in the good, and to praise Him. We should, with as much joy and relish, um, eat the chocolate cake on Thursday, which is a feast day um, if, of that particular week. Imagine Thursday is a feast day of that particular week. As we do, deny ourselves the chocolate cake on Friday, which may be a day of penance or abstinence of that particular week, right? It's, it's not a, if it feels good, it's evil. But that is how our culture and how our own moral life sometimes likes to think about it. And that's why we've got to get back to this idea of virtue, where is the virtue is in the mean, in the, in the moderation, in temperance, in, in the in loving the goodness, but not loving it so that it harms us. A very, very good question. Other questions? OK, over here, sorry. Mm -hmm. We didn't talk enough about charity, so I'm glad we're, we're back to it, because we needed to give more credence to what you guys said. So um, she asked, what is the line between charity, loving a person, and then having to correct them or, or overcome, bring up something that, that maybe they're struggling with? So I, the, the name of what you're talking about, how to correct someone, we actually call fraternal charity or fraternal correction. It's actually a desire for their good. So I told you that um, charity, the definition was friendship with God, and that's a little too simplistic. You guys were right. Uh, if we break down what friendship with God means, friendship is a mutual and reciprocal benevolence founded upon a communicatio of goods, will, intellect, secrets, life, and there's a whole long list. So this friendship, if you're friends 
with God, if you're friends with Jesus, then all of a sudden um, you have this desire for what he desires. And charity, that's charity with him. Charity with another, you start to, to truly love your friend. You start to, um, I don't know, who's the pagan that said, friendship is saying, ugh, another I. Finally, I found another, one like me, right? So you start to share intellect. You start to share will. You start to, to share the, the same desires and secrets and whatnot. So um, you truly will the good of the other. So the, the simple definition of St. Thomas also defines charity as benevolence, willing the good of the other. And so if you truly love someone, and true charity would be to say, hey, you're better than this. Like, I know you're capable. I love you. Um, and uh, that love motivates me to actually bring up this hard thing to talk about. So I would say your first example um, might just be that virtue of niceness, right? Where we're afraid to broach the, the hard things um, because conflict or... Um, obsequiousness is, conflict is abhorrent to us, or obsequiousness, never to have anyone dislike us, is our main aim. But never having conflict or never having someone dislike you is not actually the, the basis of love, right? Um, true love, there will be, in relationships of true love, there will be conflict. There will be times where you have to spur one another on to, to, to greatness. Um, and so uh, now the the realm that governs exactly what you're talking about, when to say, hey, you should stop that, or when to say, when to overlook another's fault because you, know, you need not reprove it then, is the virtue of prudence, right? Um, and so prudence moderates the right reason in action, right? So we think about the situation, we think about all the, the parts of the situation, we, um, foresight is a part of prudence, we think about what might happen, if I say this, this might happen, if I say that, that might happen. Um, and then w we make a measured decision on what we think the best, most loving course of action is, the best for the good of the other. And sometimes even the most loving thing can to be to say, I'm sorry, I can't participate with you in this, or I can't maybe even to, to say, we can't be as close friends as I desire to be because there's this obstacle to me loving you, to us having this relationship in your life, and I really wish it weren't there and I can help you remove that obstacle through true Christian charity. Does that answer your question or just add more layers of confusion? Uh, it does. I have a follow-up question, but I don't want to take it. OK. We'll come back to you. You are next. Why do we swap charity and love as words? Good question. So Lübe comes from the high German. We steal it from the Germans. Uh, Caritas is the Latin. Um, and. English is a mix, you know, of Latin and Germanic words. So charity and love are um, similar in their definition. Um, in the tradition, right, because we're Roman Catholics, Latin, whatnot, we typically speak of charity. In romance, so the romance movement um, of the, the late 1800s mostly was in Germany, uh, France, and England. Right? And so we have this romantic idea of love because of that um, romance movement there. Um, and that's where the sort of the definition of love and charity started to diverge a little bit. They should be able to be controvertible terms where we can use either one. But when you say love, it's got all these connotations because of that um, romance period. Whereas charity, too, has other connotations of, OK, you're going to write a check to help some, some homeless people, right? Um, neither one of those is, I would argue, a, a correct or good definition. It's something more like to will the good of the other or friendship with God. Um, but it is important to define our terms. And if we're talking with someone who we don't have the same sort of lexicon or vocabulary with to make sure we know what we're talking about. So they should be controvertible terms, but no, both of them carry baggage that we don't necessarily meet. Mm -hmm. Good question. Okay, we got some in the back. We'll go here first. Yeah. How, how would you define righteous? How would you define righteous anger? Good question. So, um, righteous anger falls under the province of justice, rendering each one their due, and um, the province of justice, the, the virtue of justice, the cardinal virtue of justice means that when we some, see something that uh, 
should stir the passion of anger. Anger is a, a passion or something. Should stir the passion of anger within our heart. So um, Jesus was righteously angry when he saw his father's house being turned into a den of thieves. That according to right reason, um, Jesus was righteously indignant, righteously angry. Um, in the virtue of justice, he knew that uh, what was due those money changers was to be driven from the temple because that was to be um, the father's place. So first and foremost, he had, he had righteousness. He had the correct, he had the truth on his side. Secondly, um, Jesus was, had the authority to do what he did. Uh, because he was the son of God and the temple belonged to his old pops upstairs um, and he was true God and true man, he had the authority to clear the temple in a, a righteous way of the, the money changers, right? So when we are thinking, am I righteously angry or what is the definition of righteous anger? We have to think of those two categories. One, is this subject to reason? Is the truth on my side? So when we see... Um, horrible social evil or someone being taken advantage of right in front of us, um, we know that's wrong. That shouldn't happen. And the passion of anger should stir in our hearts, right? And so then that passion of anger stirs. Next, do we have the authority? Do I have the right? Can I render justice in this instance? So if someone is being mugged in front of you, that anger, oh my gosh, this person is being taken advantage of. I am righteously angry. That gives you the energy. To, to, to wail back, punch the person in the face, or if you decide that um, you can call 911 and the police, who it is their job to deal with such issues, um, can come in time, then you call 911 and your righteous anger draws you to action and to, to find the one who is responsible or, or the correct authority, the proper authority, to render justice in that situation. That wasn't an easy textbook definition, um, but it's the righteous anger is the passion of anger subjected to reason in action that is within your own authority, within the authority God has given to you. Two more questions. One back here. Uh huh. Raul. Yes. Yeah, so he, he said, uh, I've heard referenced before, a connection between, and correct me if I'm wrong, a connection between the theological virtues and the um, transcendentals, truth, beauty, and goodness. Uh, and then from there, a connection to the cardinal virtues. Now, does that mean that you have heard that faith, hope, and love were somehow aligned more perfectly to one of the transcendentals and that the cardinal virtues were aligned or fed more perfectly into one of the theological virtues? Yeah, I think you could make a case for that. I think you could make an argument for that, and that would be, be possible. But you, the, the transcendentals, truth, beauty, and goodness, are the motivation for every virtue. Um, and of course, truth, um, yeah, the, the transcendentals in and of themselves, St. Thomas treats as controvertible. What is true is beautiful. What is beautiful is good. What is good is true, right? So there are these controvertible terms. So it would be hard for me to try and align them with particular virtues. Um, the cardinal virtues um, break down into whether they perfect the intellect or the will. The theological virtues kind of do as well, um, but like prudence is a, mainly of the intellect. Right until it's placed in action, um, justice is of the will. What you're going to do, what you're going to render. Um, but I believe I would say that there's truth, beauty, and goodness in the data or the content or the motivation of every one of the virtues. Yeah. Good question, though. Okay, last question right here, Patrick. Yes.
Yeah, that's a great question. So he asked, he's read some of the church fathers and there's debate, because a lot of the church fathers and, and the medievals after them would oppose virtues and vices, right? So like if you're really struggling with this vice, you should work on the opposite virtue, which is this. And he wanted to know about achidia or sloth, uh, and he'd seen it opposed to fortitude. Is that what you said, right? So St. Thomas takes a little different track than the Church Fathers, and I'm more familiar with that. I haven't read much of the Church Fathers on virtue and vice, but St. Thomas says that sloth or acedia is a sin against charity, actually, and that it's one of the vices opposed to charity, um, as, along with envy. Envy is opposed to charity. And um, the virtue opposed, or the vice that you struggle with with fortitude is anger, right? That and. An, excess of um, fortitude or strength will lead you unduly angry or uh, irrationally angry. Right? As we talked about just a little ago, anger isn't always bad. Sometimes angers can be righteous. But if you are looking for a fight, right? if you're willing to overcome any obstacle that comes to you, if you're going to have an excess of that, you're going to just be an angry jerk all the time. right? Just let it go, buddy. We don't need to have a fight about every single thing. But St. Thomas says that charity, or that sloth or acedia is opposed to charity because he defines sloth as sadness at God's will for us. right? And so when we're slothful, when you can't get off the couch, he doesn't define it as just laziness. And the sin isn't just not getting off the couch. The deeper sin, one of the seven deadlies, is knowing that God desires you to go and do some good thing. That God desires you know that his will for you is, well, I really should go be making my holy hour, or I really should go be reaching out to that friend. It's when we know his will for us, and we have that sort of like heaviness and sadness and we just sit there, right? Which I find myself doing all too often. Or knowing, oh my gosh, I'm gonna have to have that really hard conversation with my friend, that charitable conversation with my friend, and that just bums me out. So I'm gonna sit here and not do it. I'm gonna be slothful because I know it's gonna be hard. And in that sense, running from a hard thing, it is somewhat opposed to fortitude. But it's most opposed, says St. Thomas, to charity because it's God's love desires some good for us, and we just are too sad, too sitting there to actually accomplish it. Cool. Okay. Did, did you guys learn anything, something? Okay, that guy did. Good. We, we, if you touch one soul, Mother Teresa, if you just touch one soul, then it's worth it. Um, thanks for listening. Uh, I know it was kind of deep and kind of heady, but I want you guys to be saints, and I want you to have all the tools necessary for you to be saints. I want you to run towards heaven, not just sort of like, I mean, St. Therese did say you can take the elevator, so there may be some Theresians out there who are just going to push the button and, and take the elevator. <laughs> But for those of you who don't have that particular charism, um, I want you to run towards heaven to strive with all your heart um, to be exactly who God created you to be. And that is good. So go be virtuous. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. I'm going to close with a blessing. Or? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to give you a blessing to go. The Lord be with you. Yes. Bow your heads. Loving God, we ask generously your blessing upon these, your servants, who you have called to follow after you with all their hearts. Strengthen their faith, hope, and love. Strengthen virtue within their hearts. Pour into them all the graces they need to become the saints that you're calling them to be. May they be an example to our fallen world of your power. May your blessing remain with them always. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thanks.